When we were taking a look at electric field vectors before, we saw that when we were drawing diagrams of electric field vectors in different places in space, you could end up getting the drawings to be pretty cluttered simply because the vector arrows would keep landing over each other. Now, while the historic origins of this um, were to think about, were, were a little different, um, we do have a way of visualizing electric field maps where we don't have to draw the individual vectors. So what I'm doing here is I'm drawing electric field lines. Um, these are, you know, th these are curves. They have a direction, so that's what the little arrowhead means. And the way we interpret this is if I want to know at some particular point in space, like let's say right here, at this point in space, the electric field vector will be tangent to, oops, don't want it to be right on, be tan, okay, let's do it here, um, will be tangent to the electric field line in question, and the strength of the electric field will be proportional to the density of lines in the area. Um, now, if you don't happen to have a line readily available exactly where you want, fret not. What you do is you just kind of imagine a line in between them. As we'll see, lines can never cross. So this gives you some sense of uh, where like another line would need to go. You can imagine, okay, it looks like there'd be a line to have to do something like this. So tangent would look something like that. The density of lines here is bigger than here. So this electric field vector associated with this point has to be longer than that point. Whereas say if I'm out over here somewhere, here the space, again, I can imagine how the line would go, look something like that. And I would draw a fairly short electric field vector because the density of lines is low, the spacing is large. So the closer together the lines are spaced in the area, the bigger the vector you draw, the farther apart they are in the area, the shorter the vector you draw. Now, the amazing thing is, is if you follow the rules for how to draw these things, you've actually artistically done the math to represent the, uh, the electric field. So I'm going to give you the rules for how to draw electric field lines. Drawing elect, uh, that's a terrible E there. Electric field lines. And I'm going to give you four rules and one tip. So here's rule number one. All electric field lines start on positive charges and end on negative charges. Next rule, the number of electric field lines entering or exiting, depending on the sign of the charge, is proportional to the charge itself. If you don't have, like, if for every line you have that starts somewhere you can't, there, there you don't have enough available places to end lines or vice versa, you need more lines coming in to make up for, you need more end points and start points, Excess lines will radially go either to or from infinity. And very importantly, the lines can never cross. And the pro tip that I have is that 
there are a whole bunch of really complicated rules um, if lines are perfectly horizontal or vertical. Um, it doesn't have to do with physics particularly, it has more to do with art. Um, so, but anyway, I would just strongly urge you to avoid drawing perfectly horizontal or vertical lines. So these are the rules. And this is my tip. All right, so let's go ahead and just do this by example here. I think this is really the best way to go. Um, so let's say, for instance, I have one charge here, negative Q. And I have another charge over here, plus 2Q. So this is double the electric charge of this one. Now, generally speaking, when I decide how many lines per charge I might have, I usually work in multiples of four, because this will give you an even number of lines heading into each quadrant off of each charge. Um, so it tends to do pretty good. So. Again, since I avoid perfectly vertical lines, I just st started up four little lines here. These are all going to end in the, the charge. And if I have four um, lines going in here, since this is double the charge and it's positive, double the charge means eight lines, positive means outbound. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now, the trick is, is that you need to connect from positive to negative in a way such that the lines will never cross. So, that that's one. And you draw the arrowhead going from plus to minus, like that. Oops. something like that. And then this one here will kind of loop around back like that. This one here will loop around back the other way. And then this leaves me with four more lines that I want to kind of head eventually radially out, although in the immediate vicinity they'll curve around a bit. And the whole idea is that if I'm really, 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 really far away, um, this will look like a charge of plus one. Um, if I'm so far away that basically the negative two is stacked on top, negative Q is stacked on top of the plus two Q. Um, so at that point it should look like a point charge, and for a point charge the lines would just go out uniformly. So now if I look at this, I want to interpret this. Um, I can say, okay, like right here, at this point right here, the electric field vector is pretty pretty big and points out like that. Out over here where the density is a lot big, a lot lower, electric field vector points, say, straight back like that. If I'm in this immediate area right here, I can see that electric field vector at this point is pointing in, but if I'm far enough out, I realize that eventually I gotta be getting to the point where the, the, the outbound lines are what matters. So if I'm far enough out, the electric field has to be pointing out. This tells me it's somewhere in the middle here, I'm not sure exactly where, but somewhere around here, the electric field has to be zero, and that makes sense. I'm closer to the smaller of the two charges. So we're balancing the fact that this being farther away makes it weaker, but the charge itself is stronger. So there's gotta be a balance point where the um, contributions cancel out. Um, now, just to take a look at a particular edge case um, to see what the to, in order to try to interpret the diagrams, sometimes you do have to at least do a quick little bit of mental math. 
So for instance, here with this one, I have two positive charges. So this is not a dipole. Um, two uniform positive charges. So again, I'm going to go like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Ditto. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Something like that. Now the deal is, is that the electric field lines can never cross. So that means that like these lines have to eventually end up doing something like this. I don't know, something like that. And then, so we, over here, we can just go ahead and have these head out towards infinity. Oops, a little too aggressive on those last couple of lines. So again, here we're going to be facing the same problem. These lines can't cross. So I got to be doing something like this. And these are kind of heading out. Something like that. You get far enough away, this is eventually going to look like a single point charge of plus 2q. But right in the immediate vicinity, it's looking something like this. Now... What about the point right dead center between the two charges? Now, the thing is, is that you know, one way to think about it is like, well, no matter what I do, there's going to be electric field lines in the area, right? So you would think you have to have some electric field strength, but actually right at this exact point, the electric field strength is zero. And you can convince yourself of that because the field from this guy has to point down, the field from this guy has to point up, if this is in dead center, the two contributions are equal and it cancels. So if you see like this pattern where absolutely everything, every line is avoiding a specific point, the point being avoided has a electric field strength of zero. A bit of an edge case, but worth mentioning. Okay. Now where this can also help us to visualize things is we can imagine we can think about what the electric field inside a conductor at equilibrium would look like so electric field inside a conductor at equilibrium So the deal here is, let's say this is a conductor. You can argue that all of the charges will want to run as far away from each other as possible. So let's say this is positively charged. What this will mean is the charges will distribute evenly on the outside. So this means that the electric field contributions inside the conductor from these excess charges, they'll all cancel out. Now, you can argue this kind of by contradiction. It's not even really contradiction. Basically say, well, let's say that we didn't have just the right even distribution charges. There would be an electric field. But if there's an electric field, then you'd have an electric force and you could shove electrons around. And as the electrons get shoved around, they get shoved around until finally it does all cancel out. In fact, this does actually happen. It's just that when you give a conductor a charge, the electron cloud does all of its shifting in a fraction of a billionth of a second. So unless you're doing nanoscale electronics or something like that, this is something that you don't really care about. Um, so in equilibrium, and this is an important caveat, um,
the electric field inside is zero. Now, I did also say that excess charges will uniformly distribute themselves on the surf along the surface or on the surface of the conductor. There is an exception to that, and that is that charges prefer to pile up at pointy parts of the conductor. After we've developed the idea of electric potential, I can get around to proving why this must be, but for now, I'm just stating it as an exception and we'll get to it a bit later. And then usefully, electric field lines, electric field lines, always, well, at least after the first 10 billionth or so of a second, when after the charges get done moving around, they always enter or exit a conductor perpendicular to the surface of the conductor. And the surface is where electric field lines start or end. All right, so let me just really quickly argue for why the electric field lines have to always um, enter or exit perpendicular to the surface. So again, during the first 10 billionth of a second or so, when you're not in equilibrium, they aren't necessarily. So in the first fraction of a second, the, my electric field line might look like this. What that would mean is right here at this spot, there would be an electric field vector. But what that will do is that will cause an electron Remember, electrons are negative, so they feel a force the other way. They'll cause an electron to drift like that. As the charge distribution moves around, that will eventually um, will be piling up more negative charge over here, right? Um, and that will help to eliminate this sideways component here because the contribution of the electric field vector at this point um, will also pick up a bit towards the new bit of excess electrons over there. So eventually the end state is that the electric field line leaves perpendicular to the conductor and same if it were entering the conductor. Now this bit about the electric field inside the conductor always being zero in equilibrium, you might think, well, what if there is the conductor we're sitting in so let's say some potato shaped conductor like this. Um, what if the conductor were sitting in some sort of external electric field? Um, and that, that seems like a reasonable question to ask. So if I do this, so say I got my conductor sitting inside a big capacitor or something like that. And then I suddenly charge my capacitor and now I've got an electric field. Now, for the first 10 billionth of a second or so, when things are not in equilibrium, you will have an electric field going through the conductor. But then look at what's going to happen. What's going to happen 
is that the electrons here will be feeling a force towards the left. This will cause the whole electron cloud to shift. So this means you'll start to build up a negative surface charge over here and a little bit of a positive surface charge over here. And that will create an internal electric field that runs the opposite way. Something like that. So the red is the internal field and the hot pink was the external field. And what we'll end up with is that the net electric field inside will be zero at the end of this because as long as there's an imbalance, we'll keep moving electric charges. But as we keep moving electric charges, the internal field will strengthen and then at some point it'll just cancel out. So in equilibrium, even if there's an external field, the electric field inside the conductor is zero. All right, there's one more little topic I want to mention. It's only since that I don't know where else to put it, so I'm kind of sticking it at the end here. And I just want to think about the torque on a dipole. Um, so for instance, you can think of like a water molecule or something like that in an electric field. Um, you know, a water molecule basically looks like Mickey Mouse's head. There's the oxygen, there's a hydrogen, there's another hydrogen like that. And the deal is, is the oxygen needs two electrons to fill its valence shell. The hydrogens aren't particularly attached to their lone electrons. So what happens is, is the, the excess, the, the electrons from the hydrogen wind up spending most of their time out hanging out actually over by the oxygen more than they do by the hydrogen. So this will give us here a fractionally negative side here away from Mickey's ears and a fractionally positive side towards Mickey's ears since the electrons aren't hanging out over by the hydrogen ears that much the protons are just kind of hanging out. So you wind up getting something like this. So let's say, so let, let's just kind of go back to our more sort of a stick figure -y diagram. Um, let's say I have a dipole that looks like this, plus Q, minus Q, like that. Um, we often will draw a vector like this. I won't get into the definition of it, but we call this the dipole moment. Actually, the electric dipole moment, to be fussy. There is a proper definition and units and all that, but it isn't really relevant for our discussion here. Um, so let's go ahead and say that my dipole is sitting in a uniform electric field that I have pointing up like this. And so we can be imagining like our water molecule, something like this. All right. So in this case here, I want to ask you, is our electric dipole going to want to rotate counterclockwise, clockwise, or not at all? Pause the video and get back with me. Okay, so it turns out it's going to, in this case here, it's going to want to rotate counterclockwise. The reason for that is this is a positive charge, it will feel an electric force in the same direction. This is a negative charge, you'll feel an electric force anti-parallel. Same strength electric field, same magnitude charge. These forces are equal, so the net force is zero, so the, the, the molecule won't translate. 
However, since they are off axis with each other, they both have a lever arm or a moment arm, like so, which means that we will have a torque. And so what it will try to do is it'll try to um, get to where plus Q minus Q like that. Um, it'll try to get to where it is aligned, where the dipole moment here is aligned with the external field. This is worth remembering not so much, I mean, it's useful when thinking about how, say, water molecules interact and in the presence of an external field or other polar molecules. But it'll also be useful to just kind of get a feel for this now because later when we get to magnetism, while there are no magnetic charges, there are magnetic dipole moments. And so if we start thinking about things like the electric dipole moment wants to align with the electric field, it'll be a little easier to think about the analogous thing when we get to magnetism. Alrighty, I'll catch you in the next video.